Over the past few years, you've probably seen the headlines that pop up every few days. This deleted scene changes everything! You've also noticed that these deleted scenes actually don't change everything because they were removed from the final cut of the film. Even so, we watch the videos and read the articles, but why? Well, seeing a deleted scene, we know that it was supposed to be in the movie at first, but then it got taken out. This knowledge brings us one step closer to the people making the movies we love. It gives us insight into the decision-making processes of the people we admire. Over the years, this has grown into an obsession. We've tried to get and have been given increasing amounts of behind-the-scenes access, but where does this desire come from, and where will it lead? So, if the whole draw of deleted scenes is that they make the viewers feel like they're part of the movie-making process, like they're getting a window into how editing decisions get made, it's probably worth looking at who makes these decisions. Obviously, the editor is a big part, but the editor is also supervised, or at least in consultation with, the director. But the director, who's supposed to be the brains behind the whole operation, is also beholden to the studio. And the studio cares about money more than anything else. The director of American History X, Tony Kay, perfectly illustrates this tension between art and money and the mythology that's bubbled up around it. Before directing movies, he directed TV ads. These ads were not conventional by any means. Some of them are so artistic that they border on incomprehensible, like these ads for tires. American History X was his first feature and he wanted to bring the same uncompromising ethos to the big screen. When he turned in the final cut of the movie, the executives at New Line Cinema gave him some edits and the editors cranked out another version. The execs, the producers, and even Ed Norton were all happy with it, but not Tony Kay. In fact, he was so offended by what he saw as a compromise that he put out full-page ads in Variety and The Hollywood Reporter to protest. One of them quoted a John Lennon lyric, Everybody's hustling for a bucket of dime. I'll scratch your back if you knife mine. Another quoted the philosopher Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is for enough good men to do nothing. He threatened to ditch the movie there and then, but after some negotiation, the studio let him go back in the editing room and recut the movie so that it satisfied everyone. Why does this matter? Well, it's an extreme example of a common image. The all-important artiste director clashing with the dull, pencil-pushing executives who only care about PG ratings and their bottom line. This disagreement is central to a lot of the appeal of deleted scenes. But first, let's step back and look at where the idea of a director's cut even comes from. In the 60s and 70s, when directors started to become bigger celebrities and therefore able to sell movies with their names, they were given more creative freedom. People look back on this era and see movies like The Godfather, Raging Bull, etc. and think of it as a kind of golden age of the director. Whether or not that's true, any greatest of all time list for movie directors will be crammed with names from this era. But the distribution of movies wasn't exactly ripe for director's cut re-releases just yet. It took until the early 2000s for the deleted scene and the director's cut to reach peak pop culture relevance. Why the 2000s? It's all because of DVDs. This is DVD. DVDs, an abbreviation of the very sexy, digital versatile disc, were first sold to the public in 1996. At this point, they were very expensive. A single disc could run you about $100, so the average person wasn't quite convinced that this was the future of entertainment. But like every technology, the price dropped pretty quick, and within a few years, the DVD player replaced the VCR. They're smaller, less clunky, and less involved than the whole Be Kind Rewind VHS setup. But DVDs also have way more space on them. So to sell DVDs, movie studios had to get creative about how to fill all that space. There were, of course, those strange interactive games where you'd use the clunky controls on your remote to choose your own adventure, but there were also a lot of behind-the-scenes content like bloopers, interviews, and deleted scenes. The deleted scenes ended up being the most popular content, even if those clunky games are nostalgic fun, and the movie studios decided to go all-in on the moments that were previously lost to the cutting room floor. 2001, Miramax released what they called a redux of Apocalypse Now, which added two extra scenes to a movie that was already very long. The two scenes included one where the main characters meet some Playboy bunnies for a second time further down the river, and another where they end up on a colonial rubber plantation where the French residents have refused to leave. The two scenes don't really add much at all other than a quick history lesson for those who don't know about France's occupation of Vietnam, which is why they were cut from the original. 
but this stuff is like candy for fans of the film who, after watching it countless times, finally get more. But more importantly, he also gets some insight into the decision-making process behind what got cut and what didn't. It brings them one step closer to the people who made the film and makes them feel like they're on the director's side against the big money-grubbing studios. Because I haven't learned my lines yet. I know you've why. had them for five days. <laughs> this redux opened the floodgates. While there have been director's cuts since the 70s, it now became expected that the DVD release of a movie would include a director's cut, although these weren't even necessarily the edits that the director liked most, they were often just versions with all the unused footage spliced in. The most famous example from this era has to be the extended cut of Lord of the Rings. Because these movies were based on books, there was a lot that had to be cut out of the actual theatrical release of these films. The Lord of the Rings lore is so expansive that you would probably need a 100 hour movie to get anywhere near the depths that the books reached. Lord of the Rings also had a big dedicated fan base that wants to see every little thing that has to do with the books or movies. The director Peter Jackson knew this, but he also knew that including everything wouldn't actually make a good movie. He says he actually prefers the theatrical release, but he still wanted to give the people what they wanted. The motivation for the DVDs is to give the fans the stuff that we couldn't include in the film, he said and it has only grown out of the fact that we have so much footage. We didn't ever think we were doing extended cuts when we were shooting the movie, but when we started to cut the films and we realized that there were all the scenes that weren't going to be in the movie, we just thought, well, these are good scenes. They're legitimate parts of the book. They're scenes that people would be wanting or expecting to see. So we put them in this alternate version for the fans. At the time, I felt that I was sacrificing pacing and momentum in order for these scenes to go in, but I figured that the theatrical versions exist, so this is like a version for the real aficionados who want to see this extra material. Injury. The list goes on. A director's cut of Blade Runner was re-released during this era, in which Ridley Scott cut all of Harrison Ford's narration. In 2009, Peter Bogdanovich released a new version of his 1976 comedy, Nickelodeon, in black and white. In 2007, there was Spider-Man 2.1, a special edition DVD released of 2004 Spider-Man 2, starring Dopey McGuire. Although the original is still regarded as an all-time Spidey classic, the 2.1 edition has also become a cult favorite, mostly because of one scene. After the Daily Bugle proclaims that Spider-Man is no more, we see J. Jonah Jameson, the number one Spidey hater, wearing the blue and red suit as he jumps around his office, chomping on a cigar and pretending to sling webs. It's a great scene, but do we need it? The answer in this case and almost all others is no. The director's cut craze has gone out of control. It was once reserved for all-time great directors who felt stifled by studio restrictions, but now we've been blessed with director's cuts for movies like Never Say Never, the Justin Bieber documentary, Saw 3, and Bad Santa. Are you saying there's something wrong with my gear? Is that what you're saying to me? Ali Upham, the former editor of DVD and Blu-ray Review magazine, summed up the good and the bad of the director's cut. Some have the power to make a bad movie better, like Daredevil, or the beautiful, sprawling version of Ridley Scott's Kingdom of Heaven. Others simply glorify iconic movies, adding richness, detail, and the occasional subplot, like the Apocalypse Now redux and the extended cuts of Lord of the Rings. That also creates a problem, though, because the director's cut can also turn into a vulgar cash cow, culminating in a super deluxe collector's edition. And that holds all nine discs inside. So it's out of control, but how do we let it get to this point? To explain this, we have to turn to Lil Uzi Vert. The obsession with deleted scenes is just one example of the broader desire to get behind the scenes. This is the exact same desire that fuels tabloid magazines, the expensive backstage meet and greet passes at concerts, and even social media. What it boils down to is people's desire for access. When we watch a scene that the director, editor, or studio decided to cut, we feel invited into the filmmaking process, a process which usually remains secret. It's a window into how these people, who are usually larger than life names in the credits or faces on a screen, make decisions. It's a window into them as people. Jar Jar is a key to all this, because he's a funnier character than we've ever had in any of the movies. Well. Lil Uzi is a person too, but he's also a rapper and a fashion icon. He's very famous, and people all over the world are obsessed with him and his irreverent ways of rapping and dressing. So, when Virgil Abloh, another very famous guy, the founder of Off-White and the creative director at Louis Vuitton, was asked to do his video, he decided to make it about fame and access. Here's what he had to say about it. Street, and then they just go through this like mystical door, then no one sort of breaks that barrier. There are some things in the video that are either incomprehensible or very funny, like getting the weekend to rap as if he were Uzi, or the super fake lighting in the background. But the important thing is the beginning where Virgil is filmed holding a camcorder, walking into this fancy hotel and all the way up to Lil Uzi Vert's room, where a party has obviously happened. 
It then switches to the camcorder's perspective and shows people passed out. This is candy for the fans. They get access, even if it's fake access, to Uzi's hotel room and to Virgil's process. That alone is enough to get people very excited about that video. At the time of writing, it's got 369 million views. But now, the deleted scene and the director's cut's days are numbered. A shift is taking place and has been for quite a while. Looking at the movies of Adam McKay, Will Ferrell, and the countless imitators they inspired, you can see this shift taking place. I've never even slept with a lady! These films were the biggest comedies of their day. Milk was a bad choice. From Anchorman to Bridesmaids to Superbad, this was THE style. Nothing like them had ever really been made before, with their off-the-wall one-liners and generally stupid humor. Absolutely, ma'am. I'd love to sign your baby. You know? Wait, you changed your name to McLovin? They were so popular in part because we all knew how they were made. It was just a group of funny, famous friends in a room together, trying to one-up each other with outrageous lines. You can get pink eye from farting in a pillow? Totally. Because they improvise so much while filming them, these movies have pretty much infinite behind-the-scenes footage so much that they often wouldn't even wait for the DVD to release it, like in Talladega Nights where the whole credits are different takes of lines from the movie. There are fake public service announcements, The dragon eats some mouse and chases through the bamboo, descriptions of Jesus, childhood version of me, except with a beard, and deathbed confessions. One of them held a steak knife to my throat while the other one took my wallet. In the case of Anchorman, they had so much footage that they even made up a whole movie with clips and subplots that didn't make it into the theatrical release called Wake Up Ron Burgundy. But we don't see these types of comedies being released all that much anymore. Why is that? A tarantula enjoys a fine chewing gum. A big part of it has to be the deleted scenes and the bloopers. This brand of comedy was so captivating because, at the time, it was fresh but also because it allowed us unprecedented access into the process of making comedy. If you had the DVD of one of these, you could see almost every option they tried for a given line and even judge them for yourself. You would see kids at school mimicking the style, trying to one-up each other on the playground. But then, after almost a decade, everyone got tired. Seeing so many of the lines that didn't make the cut and all the attempts that it took to get the final product, it kinda ruined the magic of the whole thing. This whole style of comedy began to feel a little transparent and flat. It's no coincidence that we don't see it anymore. The mystery behind these movies was lost because they showed us too much. We want to feel like we have access, but not too much. <laughs> but what about now? DVDs are pretty much gone. The auteur directors who were so big in the 70s are almost gone. Improv comedies are on the decline. How are we going to get our behind the scenes fix? Careful actor at work, something just snapped up. A lot of people on the internet are doing their best to convince you that deleted scenes are still the way. That this one deleted scene from Star Wars The Last Jedi changes everything. Or that you won't believe these deleted scenes from the MCU even exist. Sure, deleted scenes will probably stick around as long as there are movies. But our craving for exclusive access is being satisfied much more effectively by newer mediums that are all about access, whether it's manufactured or not. It doesn't matter where it's happening. It could be on Instagram or TikTok, Facebook or wherever. Here on set, Central Intelligence, hanging out, I'm shooting my video. But the fact that we can get this direct access straight from the source with what seems like no mediation, things have come a long way. If you wanted to see any behind the scenes footage from one of the biggest blockbusters of the 90s, you would have to just wait until the DVD came out, and then you'd have to go and buy it. <gasps> But now, if you want to get behind the scenes of the next big movie, you can just go on Chris Pratt's Instagram. These platforms, while they're supposedly about connecting people to each other, are very good at exploiting our desire to cross the boundary between normal life into celebrity life, like the hotel in the Lil Uzi Vert video. But they also make us feel like we're being brought into the fold, like we're collaborators in these people's process. Whereas actors used to be in a secret club of mysterious people that we only saw portray other characters, the borders are now open into their personal lives. Gone are the days where every little thing gets put through a filter of managers and PR specialists before being released to the public. Now, someone can have a few too many adult cocktails and accidentally tweet out some outlandish comments for the entire world to see. Cake mup, it get hurt, it get get cake mup, and what's my snack? In a way, does that not scratch the same behind-the-scenes access itch that deleted scenes have been scratching for so long? Maybe we don't even need deleted scenes anymore to get insight into the making of a film. Instead, you can just DM Martin Scorsese. What do you think about deleted scenes? 
Are they boring cash cows or do they enrich the movies we already love? What is your absolute favorite deleted scene? Let us know in the comments and thanks for watching Behind the Screen. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe for much, much more.